You remember what the assignment was. Oh, for those who were not here last week, who needs a book and who needs materials? I've got them here. Okay. You need some too? Okay. Anybody else need materials? Can't do the homework if you don't have the materials. I heard that there were $20 bills in there. Ah, that was last week. Oh. <laughs> oh, by the way, he's hard of hearing. So he could have heard it anything, anywhere. And my name's Sam, right, Bruce? Uh, come on now. Uh, did you do your homework? The assignment for this last week was to do the compatibility checkup. And uh, you were supposed to go in, and there's two copies of that accountability, so you and your partner could each fill out a copy. And then, independent of each other, you're filling this out, and then you get together and you have a discussion. And you discuss whether or not you agree or disagree, and why you agree or disagree. So how many of you actually did that? Okay, very few. Uh, guess what, we got grace. We got grace. Those of you who didn't do that will get a whole lot more out of the rest of this study if you take the time, just a few minutes. I mean, you can mark it up in about five minutes and maybe have a 15 minute discussion. It will be the most important discussion that will ensure your success or failure in doing what we're trying to do here. Okay? You've heard about that, those, those oxen, they're unequally yoked. You know, you gotta have, gotta have an even pull. Wouldn't do too much if one was heading east and one was heading west. So we need to have everybody on the same page going in the same direction. The second thing you were supposed to do was have begin the process of tracking your variable expenses. Anybody get started on the variable expense tracking? Okay, good, got a couple, all right. You really need to do this. It is the foundation of whether or not you're going to be able to appropriately analyze whether or not you're spending and if you're headed toward the tank or if you're headed toward the heaven. And it's really, really, really important that, that you do this process. You got four weeks to complete it, but you got to do it every week, every day of every week. And just, you know, keep your receipts. Stick them in your wallet, pull them out, put down what you did. Um, or you can go online if you use your debit card and see the transactions as they post. Uh, if you use a credit card, you can go online and see it as they post. The only part that's really vulnerable is those cash expenditures. So, swear off cash for a month. Uh, that's tough, huh? Easier than you might think. Swear off cash, though, for a month. And then hold on to your receipts, and then just at the end of the day, take just a few minutes to put them down. Because when we get to the lesson at the end of those four weeks, we're going to be starting the process of really getting down in, into your finances. So we will have an accountability check when I'm teaching this class. Don't tell me the dog ate it, okay? <laughs> Don't tell me the dog ate it. Now, priorities. We gotta have priorities when we're working with finance. So can you give me an example of a financial priority that might be difference, have difference? I will call on you. That's not a threat. Paul, I'll start with you. Can you repeat that? Give me an example of a priority. I'll give you one of what I'm talking about. Do you want to buy groceries or go to the movies? Oh, okay. you're, gonna, you're making a choice, okay? You're setting a priority. Now, give me an example of a priority. Not that one that's necessarily problematic for you. Just give me an example of two situations where you have to make a choice. Eat 
Eating out or eating at home? Eating out or eating at home. You got one? Okay. Give me some more. I need some, some that really get to the meat of the matter. Have you ever heard anyone say, I'm making a choice about whether to go to the doctor or paying my bills? That's a, that's a priority issue, isn't it? That's a priority issue. What about giving money to X organization versus creating additional contributions at church. That can be a dilemma. Why do you reckon that we have so much talk about our priorities? Before I do that one, probably need to think about, well, no, we'll just go with this one. Matthew 6, God is more important than money. Don't store up treasures for yourselves here on earth where moth and rust is, do, will destroy them and thieves will break in and steal them. But store your treasures in heaven where they cannot be destroyed by moths or rust and where thieves cannot break in and steal them. Your heart will be where your treasure is. The eye is, in the, light of the, the eye is the light of the body. For if your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are evil, your whole body will be full of darkness, and only the light that you have is, will, that you really have is darkness, then you will be worse than darkness. No one can serve two masters. The person will hate one master and love the other, or will follow one master and refuse to follow the other. You cannot serve both God and worldly riches. That's the priority issue. That is the priority issue. So why do you suppose, why do you suppose God takes that position? Why do you suppose that is? He's, he, go ahead, Bruce. I think it's because worldly riches are so seductive. Yeah. It's not, it's not a neutral, at least in that section of Matthew. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not something that's neutral. Something that so easily competes uh, against the sovereign God. Okay, so I think what you're saying is God wants to be number one, right? God wants to be number one. Where does God being number one first come up? You know? How about Exodus 20? The first, let's see, I made a note of those verses. Well, I'll have to find it here. I need to back up. My notes are not, ah, Exodus 21 through 17. I never can remember the numbers. I can tell you that, this though, that where the problem lies is in the very first commandment. The very first commandment that begins in verse 3 and goes through verse 6. Anybody want to pull out there? their version of the Bible and, and share that with us? Uh, no, I want you to read all 17 verses. You're good. I've had you read last time. Yeah, keep going. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold guiltless anyone who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart as holy. For six days you may labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your cattle or the resident foreigner who is in your gates. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and seen all that's in them and rested on the seventh day. 
Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and said in the heart of the Lord, Honor your father and your mother, that you may live a long time in the land of the Lord your God to give you. You shall not hurt, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not be a false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thank you. The very first one, the Ten Commandments, the very first one, I want to be number one, says God. I want to be the most important thing in your life. Now, how many of us truly live in a relationship with God where we always put him number one? Okay. Uh huh. he asked the man, What did you do? And he explained, Well, I listened to the woman, and the woman listened to the servant. And from the very beginning, what he wanted was them to listen to him. Right. I, I, I think that is an example of them not placing him number one. He, they certainly did not place him number one. And, but this went down on stone tablets up on a smoky filled mountain that terrible things would happen even if they touched the mountain and he said and if you read those verses he spent more words talking about that very first commandment than he said in the whole rest of it I mean really no. They got, he got three full verses, long verses, of, of, of that one commandment, God should be number one. Then Jesus starts talking about you can't serve both God and personal riches. That just reinforces it all the more. So... That's why God would do that. God wants to be number one. Now I want you to ask you the tough question. Where is he in your pecking order? Where is he in your priority? Because really, that's the whole reason the class is being taught. Are you doing with the resources that God makes available to you what he would want you to do with them. He wants to be number one. He wants to have your attention. He wants you to worship him and him alone. If we're going to become more like Jesus, we need to believe God's word and to learn to become better givers. Our human nature is to say, well, our money is our money. But as we learned last week, it's not ours. It's not ours at all. Why do you think that we believe that it's our money? Okay, you work for it. Ah, yes, I think that's the number one reason. There are several more on my list. Inheritance. Huh? Inheritance. Uh, I didn't make my hip parade, but that is, that is something that is there. What else? Why do we feel like it's our money? We're in control of it. We're in control of it? I'll just go ahead and put mine up there. I put that you sacrifice for it. Sometimes we sacrifice, my work was sacrifice. Uh, you know, my, my, my secular work was a sacrifice. I got up early in the morning and spent long hours at the office and came back. After, and I felt like, oh, I worked hard for that. Now, those people who worked up, who grew up on a farm, I know they believed that it was hard work and they sacrificed for it. I can't think of more labor where people do sacrifice more than probably being a farmer or a rancher 
I worked one summer, one summer on a farm before I turned 16. And I decided that ain't mine. No, not my, not my future in that. But we also think that we spend money for important personal purposes. Now let's go back and revisit what God's promise was as Jesus delivered on the Sermon on the Mount. I will provide the needs for the needs. And what we need to try to figure out is, do we let things sort of slop over out of the, well, it'd be nice to category into the needs category? I need that 65 inch TV. No, I don't need that 65 inch TV. I need that car that will almost drive itself. No, I don't. I need better clothes than I've been wearing. No, I don't. We don't really know how to define our needs very well. We sort of take a lot of grace with that definition. We, we play with it a little bit too much. It's not wrong to feel like you're invested with your resource with the resources that are that are uh, that you're in charge of you should feel an obligation what we have is a misguided obligation there's a new word or it's an old word but it's got a, it's gotten more popular in the last couple of three years in the financial world it's called fiduciary. Okay? A fiduciary is a person who takes care of somebody else's money, not caring what their benefit is to be derived from taking, helping you take care of that money, but looking out for your best interests. You'll hear people on some commercials for uh, people who do investing that. We're a fiduciary. We don't take commissions anymore. We take a, we take a flat fee or we, we do better when you do better is one of the phrases that you'll hear in some of those commercials. Yeah, that's being a fiduciary. We are the ultimate fiduciaries. Our responsibility in taking care of the resources that are entrusted to us is to take care of them the way God wants them taken care of. If you have an investment advisor that tells you that you ought to go buy X stock or bonds or put it into silver or cyber cash or whatever, if that's not truly what your wishes are, they're not serving you as a fiduciary. We are charged to be fiduciaries. We're supposed to take care of the resources that God gives to us in a way that he wants the, the, the money spent, the way he wants us to take care of our assets. We have, to, we have to relinquish our preferences to those of God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and the world and all who live in it. We are children of God, but we're also possessions of God. That's a deeper relationship. I know some people who love their possessions more than they do family. I wouldn't say I've ever done that, but I've gotten close, I'm afraid, on time, sometimes. And it really, what you've got to do is you've got to say, hey, what are my priorities going to be? What is important to, to what is, what is important to God should be the, the way that my priorities are established. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. You may say to yourself, my power and strength is in my hands and have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God is the one who gives you the ability to produce the wealth. Hmm. We're talking about it way back then. Now, this is a little different twist. 
Do you think it's wrong to fail to make the payments to people you justifiably owe? What would God say to that answer to that question? I'll say it again. Yeah, right. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. That's what they, he said, and whose who's, who's image is on the coin. Yeah, yeah. How many of you you've heard of the year of Jubilee? All right. There was a provision. Well, let's talk about, let's just talk about some general history in finance. They were, the Jews were really not supposed to charge what was referred to as usury to, to the folks that they made loans to. And that's technically interest. If you paying finance charges, that's usury. Uh, and the people were told that if you make a loan to somebody, then you've got a pretty high obligation to do that. But just in case there are adverse circumstances, every seven years, you can wipe out all the debts. You must wipe out all the debts. Did you know that's where the, the United States Bankruptcy Code gets the seven year period for applying bankruptcy? You can only file once every seven years. It's biblically based. But we also have examples of where this man owed this person a lot of money and he was unable to pay. And he pled with him for additional time so his family would not be thrown into debtor's prison until he could repay all that was, was owed. And the person whom he owed money had mercy on him and said, okay, that's fine. But then he turns around and goes out for, and goes to another person that owes him money, just a small amount compared to what he was in debt for. And he, excises, he, he executes his ability to have that person put into prison. And he was called to task for having done that because that's not equitable, number one, but it's also not the way that God wants us to emulate the way he forgives us. Bruce. We, we must continue to strive toward paying our debt. Right. We need to understand that how you feel about this should help you decide how you're going to allocate the money that you have. You can over obligate yourself. And as a person who used to make loans, I've been complicit in letting people be over obligated. And sometimes, you know, you make the wrong, you make the wrong decision for the right reason. You know, they have a, they have a need and they, they come across as being honest but you, you never know 
what's really going on in the background. We'll talk about background checks at a later state, but you know, that's, that's, sometimes there are circumstances when you can't pay them on time. Doesn't mean you stop. The way you handle it's different, but you still have the obligation to be a person of integrity. I mean, think about this. How many of you have ever worked where your, your situation financially was just day to day? I was, I was fired once. I was fired once and I was worried about providing food to my wife and children. I had a time there where I had to depend on others to, for assistance. My family predominantly. But I, was, I also had a responsibility to contact those that I owed to try to work out arrangements with them. And they had to know that I really wanted to pay. Because if they didn't think I was really wanting to pay and I was avoiding them, they were going to take me to court, take assets and so forth. But getting yourself into that position is not always as a direct result of having spent, but maybe living too close to the edge. Because you can live too close to the edge that makes you, you vulnerable. And that's something that we're, we really would try to, to, to fix with this class. If you think that, that, if you think that it's wrong to, to fail to make payments to people, that's, that's good. God wants to give, for us to give and honor our financial obligations. It's not an either or proposition. It's not an either or proposition. Now, there are some that will tell you that you give and you give and you give. I've had, I've had preachers preach sermons on giving. And they say, give until it hurts. Uh, if it's hurting, if it's hurting, particularly if it's hurting between the ears, you're already got a problem. And that's a problem that's a totally different set of circumstances. Your priorities are not arranged right. If you feel like that you can cut back on giving and continue to overspend on things of lesser priorities, then you've got a problem with priority setting. And we've got to fix that before you can even fix the financial piece. You've got to get that done. So if we're not giving, so what do we do if we're not giving God our first and best? What's the answer to that? You have to change your priority, yeah. Can, can priorities be changed overnight? It probably depends on what situation you're in financially. Well, yes. I mean, you can change the priority, but you might not be able to execute on it. Execute. Yeah, that's the difference. You can change the priority, but how you get from point A to point B is, is, is really much about uh, making sausage. You don't wanna see it made sometimes. Uh, you don't, every, and everybody's answer is going to be unique and individual to them. Sorry, I was just thinking about the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Uh -huh. You know, George changed his priorities basically overnight. Yeah. So going back to what Shalane said, it, it's all dependent on the circumstances really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two cents. That's, that's good, Jerry. I appreciate that. We need to acknowledge that God owns all things, including our ability to earn, 
and everything that we have really belongs to him. We need to ask God to trust, to help you trust him that you can put him first. You gotta change your heart first. That's the first element of getting this thing fixed, all right? If you don't change your priorities, you're not gonna be able to change your finances. That's just as simple as it is. You're not gonna be able to get there. Is tithing an Old Testament thing and not relevant today? I put a D in there. I gotta use my spell checker better. Um, should I have Marilyn look at my work? She does my, my checking. Um, so, what about tithing? Well, yes, sir. On realistic levels, a person, well, I've changed my priorities, but I can only, I feel like I can only give 5%. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do that. Chances are if I keep that up, if you come to discipline, it develops, and when I go up, I can go up to 7.5, I can go up to 10%. And sometimes I can keep building on it, you know, it kind of depends on the person's uh, financial situation. And that sort of leads me, Paul, to what I would like to see this class work into. Some people can lose weight just by following a written diet plan and having a good spouse that cooks what they're supposed to cook and doesn't let me get away with cheating. Um, some of us need to go to meetings sometimes to, uh, to have greater support. Sometimes people who are using alcohol or drugs, they need to have support mechanisms. I don't think this is any less of a disease that requires any less support from community. And we're, we're a, a community organization in this church. We're trying to become missional in, our, in this church. That means we're trying to reach out and find ways to help people within the community. If we can get people to listen to our message and buy into this message and say, okay, I need to change things, it becomes relevant. The thing is, is 10% much, too much, not enough? What do you think? Yeah, but what if you think, well, I'm giving zero now and I want to go to 5% and then you get stuck at 5%. I don't think that's what... Oh, I don't, I don't think that was what Paul was saying. But what I'm saying is, without the support, you might get stuck at 5% and say, well, I'm, I'm better than I was. Should 10% be a target? Hmm? Well, in the book that you were given, there is a section in there on, on giving, and it talks about things other than just tithing. It talks about tithing. It talks about alms. Okay. There's other ways to give, but if you were thinking about, I wouldn't, consider you it wrong to give more than 10 percent and call it a tithe i mean it's sort of semantics the way i view it <laughs> you know it's it's taking money that is god's and employing it in a special direction all right um it we need to we need to do that but i think that in my mind there is a minimum level that you really need to attain to say, this is what I'm always going to do. And I don't want to ask, but I would suggest that there are many in most congregations, in fact, most in most congregations that don't even come close to this. And if there is a sermon about a need, financial need, 
they'll reach into their wallet and pull out whatever's in there and throw it into the collection plate, but they don't do their giving as a planned, executed process. They don't do it with regularity. They don't do it with consistency. And they don't make, they don't deny themselves if it comes down to the priority staying where it needs to be. It's awful easy to say, well, the contribution level's up this week. I, I think I might be able to spend a few more dollars on X to, for myself. That's something we need to avoid. Tithing was a matter of law. Today, it's a matter of love. So, if I were to ask all the guys, how much do you love your spouse? Would they say, well, I, I show up 10% of the time. Hmm? Or I tell her 10% of the time that I appreciate her. 10% seems like a pretty low threshold. You know, I was always wondering, you know, there's no description in Genesis that I've been able to find, and I've read every version of it I can really find, trying to figure out why Abel's sacrifice was more favored than Cain's. They did he, he gave of his first fruits and of his best. It doesn't say that God told him that it needs to be a blood sacrifice. It, doesn't, it does not teach that in, the, in, in Genesis. I would say that the issue was a matter of the heart. I can't prove that. But absent a command for both to give the same thing, there had to be something within the individuals that was common. And it was really, I, in my mind, it had to be their relationship with God and how willing they were to give the sacrifice. And God found one to have a a better response to the request for sacrifice than the other, and that caused friction between the two brothers. It was a command in the Old Testament. It's a matter of love today. I'm not so sure it wasn't also a matter of love from the beginning. God does not need our 10%. Why? It's not our 10%. It's not ours. It's not ours. We're charged with splitting it up. Today we acknowledge the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Our giving in some respects is an acknowledgement of our appreciation for the sacrifice that Jesus gave. Everything we do in church is an expression of our appreciation for the, for the gift of the Savior. The reason we sing, we remember it in the Lord's Supper. Everything we do, our good works, are aimed at being an acknowledgement of a debt that we owe that we can't pay. Do you really want to give God uh, his money? You may feel that doing other things gives you a pass on being a generous giver, but really does it? You think it does, Bruce? <laughs> oh, I saw you nodding. 
or are you going to sleep on me? <laughs> you <laughs> Some on somebody talk to me here. I'm having a hard time. Todd, talk to me. Does doing other things give you a pass on being a generous giver? I'm going to go, I'm going to come down to the building and I'm going to spend every hour that I can putting food into the, into the loaves and fishes truck. Does that give you a pass in not making your weekly contribution? No. What do you think, Todd? Yeah, Todd. No. No? No. It's okay to have a different opinion. resources. This may have already been said because I can't hear that well. Okay. But the, let me just say, it, it, generally speaking, I would say the answer is no. It, does, it doesn't excuse you. I said generally. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, we all know there are people that the little fixed income or even if it's not fixed income, it's, it's, it's me. Right. And they struggle to survive. They struggle to to pay doctor's bills or get the pharmaceutical bill or whatever the case may be. But what they do is, that in their own way, they, they're going to be up here at the building anytime the building is open and they're going to serve as much as they can serve. Right. And you know what? Their heart is still with God. Right. And so I, I think that's the bottom line. I'm running long and I'm going to have to pick up the pace here. Let's consider the rich young ruler. He did everything right. He obeyed many laws under the Old Testament. He asked Jesus what he needed to do to be saved. Jesus answered him in a different way. He explained that he needed to be born again and that he should sell everything and give the money to the poor. Then come follow him. And he went away sorrowful. Why did he go away sorrowful? He was unwilling to sell everything he had. Just unwilling. He'd already done the, the other commands. He still had the idol though. He still had the idol. And Jesus knew that he had that. Zacchaeus. He was collecting money that he really wasn't due. He was collecting money that was more than the authorities would have normally allowed. And he changed his heart to the point to where he says, not only am I going to return what I've overcharged, but I'm going to do it in multiples. I'm going to, if I took $100, I'm going to give you $400. He's, he went to the extreme on making things right. And he was rewarded because he says that salvation went to his house that day. He also said he was going to give 50% of his earnings to the poor. Mm. That's a bit more than tithing, I would think. Just a bit. He didn't get 
He didn't get an attaboy. He didn't get a certificate. He got something worth far, far more. Jesus knew the hearts of both the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus. He also knows ours. And what we've got to do now is we've got to work on our hearts to get them ready to make some really tough choices. Now, next week, as I mentioned last week, I'm not going to be here. You're going to have a much better teacher. Jack is going to be teaching the parable of the talents. There's some real important lessons to be learned there. And then we're going to have a couple of weeks off. And by that time, I need four weeks worth of variable expense tracking. And I need you to do the homework that was assigned for this week. Okay? So go at home and fill out the forms and have your discussion. Because you cannot be pulling in different directions and come out to a good end. Did anybody else need materials? My time is up and the class is ended. Thank you.